Great. Hello and welcome to the Business Made Easy show. I'm your host, Fiona Hall, known as the how-to lady. Now, the Business Made Easy show is for business owners who are looking to find the easier way to do business because they started out in business and they had a passion for what they do, but guess what? There's a whole bunch of things they don't know how to do. So my mission is to go out and learn about stuff and find easy ways to do things by interviewing experts in their field. And today I'm very privileged to have a good friend and a fantastic woman um, on board. I'm interviewing her name is Deborah Shontree, so we'll get to that a bit later. So um, the, the thing about being an expert in your field is they know the hacks, they know the shortcuts, they know the key questions to ask to help us get through those stumbling blocks in business. So that's why they're here. Now, um, for those of you who aren't already part of the Facebook community, I've got the Business Made Easy tribe. And the tribesters in there, they get access to tips and hints every day. I go out there, I love learning, I love reading, I love finding information. And also the guest experts also join that group. So if you want to get in touch with them at a later stage, there's a great place to connect with them. It's also a tribe that is sharing information as well. So it's a really cool place as a business owner to learn stuff and to share stuff maybe that you might not feel comfortable in front of your team or um, virtual assistants or other people in your business network. So um, that's us. I'll make sure the link's for you in the show notes so you can jump on there if you aren't a member already. Now the next part of the show, it's my nugget of wisdom. So each show that we, we have, I put together a little nugget of wisdom from my how-to expertise. So I wanted to talk about the word accountability. So as a business owner, we're the boss, we get to choose how we work and what we do, and that's a great amount of freedom, and that's probably why a lot of us kind of chose to be a business owner, to get access to that freedom, to have more choice, because we felt maybe stifled when we were an employee. The problem with choice is sometimes it can be a bit too freeing and we lose track of being accountable. I know Deb can probably um, relate to that if we've had conversations about that accountability before. So when you are in charge of making decisions on a daily basis, it can be really easy for us, those creative types, which is probably, I might put my hand up for that one, to lose track of the activities that we actually need to be doing on a daily, weekly basis to get the money coming in. Um, and to focus on the sales-focused activities and all the other things we need to do that maybe we're not so keen on. So being accountable means that you um, have someone, either it might be you know, your team that you're accountable to, could be a coach, it could be a mentor, it could be a mastermind group, and they help you stay on track. So there's a level of trust, obviously, that needs to be developed when you're going to be accountable to somebody. But I know personally, when I'm not accountable to anybody else but myself, I can definitely deviate from my course. It's part of being a human being. We're all human beings um, and <laughs> we're easily distracted at times. So what I mean by being accountable, I just want to define that a little bit further for you. It means to own the things you know you need to do, be doing and are not doing. <laughs> it means being open to feedback and to putting an actionable plan in place. And it also means to dig deep with those feelings and be prepared to be honest and ask for help. I know that ask for help has been my biggest bugbear, my biggest learning curve. And it's still something that I need reminding of now and again. I need a bit of a slap around the head saying, Fiona, <laughs> stop trying to do it all yourself. So that's my nugget of wisdom for today's show. Um, if that's something that um, you can relate to, then um, I suggest going and asking and finding either, you know, one of those th ways that I mentioned, um, you know, instituting that if you've got a team with your team and being accountable to each other, um, looking for a coach or a mentor or a mastermind group. Find the method that works for you because we're all different personalities and there'll be some things that work better for others than... Um, you know, know yourself and know what your needs are. But be accountable as a business owner. That will help you go faster rather than getting stuck in your own head. Now, if you want to get a hold of me, um, you can visit me at my website, which is www.kiffin.co.nz. Now, I'm going to move on to the next part of the show. It's to introduce my guest, the lovely Deborah Shantry from Ventel. Um, I met Deborah a few years ago when we were attending a business course 
And we bonded over our love of learning and inquiring and stretching and growing ourselves. I think that was a, yeah, I'm getting a nod from Deb, so I did, I did connect on the right thing there. That's great. <laughs> now, Deborah is a well-recognised leadership coach, workshop facilitator, uh, inspirational keynote speaker and author to be. It's very exciting for a new project for her. She's the founder of DebraTontree.com and Eventel. Now, Deb's got a unique mixture of curiosity, experience, and stories that will she'll probably interweave, I imagine, through this interview today. She was a finalist in the next Businesswoman of the Year, and her first book that she's going to be putting out, I think it's later this year, I don't know if that's still on track, is called Wine It, 25 Ways of Honouring Your Brilliance, which I'm really excited to, to read. I know... Um, that's going to be packed full of jam, packed full of wisdom from her. So, Deborah, welcome to the show, and um, tell us this topic. I'm quite excited about it because it's it's quite. You've I know you've done some amazing work with um, Sally Anderson in terms of leadership coaching, and you've really amped it up in terms of what you're delivering to your clients through that process. Would that be right? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So tell us about um, you as a leadership coach. Just give us a wee bit of an intro into why you've gone down that track. Okay. So I guess the reason that I got into it is that I find that a lot of people go into business because they're really passionate about something. Um, they end up growing a business, which can sometimes end up being a reasonable sort of size, but they get lost within that and they start fighting fires. They start getting overwhelmed and stressed. They start tolerating all kinds of things mm. and they completely lose their passion to start off with what, you know, the reason they went into business. Yeah. Um, and then they kind of get completely lost in it. And so what I help them to do is to rediscover why they first First went into it what they were passionate about and then help them to take that passion and turn it into true brilliance and so when I talk about uncovering your brilliance it's about you know what is it that makes you absolutely unique mm. and really makes your business stand out and can you know go at a, a million miles an hour as opposed to just chugging along slowly so that's what why I got into it is because I love helping people find that um, I'm very much into sharing success and celebrating success and so part of my motivation for working with people is to actually help them uncover that brilliance and then we get to celebrate success as well on the way. Nice. So tell me about the topic for the show, um, yeah, busting through the bullshit that keeps us stuck. Um, tell us about that, that your passion for that is obviously, um, you know, evidence and stuff I've been seeing that you've been putting out on social media. Um, tell us about where that's come from. So I think what I've, I've been doing this for around about five years now formally and probably a few more years before that informally. And what I've found is that of all of the people that I work with, whether it be a small business or a reasonably large business, they're all tolerating the same kind of things. And there's a whole list of things that we tolerate. We tolerate being women at home and running, you know, a house and a family and still trying to hold down a job and doing more than we're supposed to be doing in the house. We tolerate not earning enough money. We tolerate, um, you know, not getting the leads that you want, doing too much activity, never spending enough time with your family and friends. And there's just this list that goes on and on and on and on about the things that we actually tolerate. And the great news is, is that some of these things can be really easily solved. And once you can solve them, you can imagine how life changes for you because suddenly you're living a life that is free of tolerances um, and it's certainly a, it's a damn sight easier for a start, but it's also a lot more enjoyable. Yeah. So the three things I want to talk about today are um, not earning what you want, which is the biggest one that I see in a lot of yeah. businesses. Yep. Um, tolerating doing too much activity and not getting the sales that you need. And then the whole being overwhelmed and stressed. Yeah. And they're probably the three key ones. There's lots of them in there. I mean, you could easily write a list um, for Africa of the tolerances we have. <laughs> but they're the three main ones from the research that I've done. Yeah. So tell yeah. us about not earning what you want. What do you see as the, the biggest barriers that people have around that? Um, I think there's an awful lot of to do with self-worth. It's really fascinating, you know, with the, the people that I work with. I work with amazingly talented, brilliant, superb people who just blow you away by, you know, what they know, what they've done, what they've achieved. And yet somehow they seem to um, not recognise that and not own that. And there's a real thing in New Zealand I find particularly, because obviously I'm from the UK originally, I've worked in Australia and I've worked in New Zealand. But in New Zealand particularly, we are really, really scared 
of, um, well, not scared. We, we, we seem to want to underprice everything. There's that warehouse mentality, mm. the bargain bin mentality. I've got to drop my prices because that's the only way that I'll get work. And yet I have seen people who have literally tripled or quadrupled their um, hourly rate, and I don't believe in hourly rates, but, by, you know, but in terms of the actual money they earn, yeah. just by actually owning what they're worth and being really clear in what they offer to the customer so they can own that. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of it comes down to confidence. I think that until you're really sure of what it is that you know and what it is that you've done and you can actually own that, then it's very difficult to think about, gosh, how can I possibly be higher priced than my competitors? Yeah, that's a really good point. Very good point. Yeah. And I mean, you've seen that yourself, Fiona, I'm sure over the years, is that when you work with people, there is this mentality around, first of all, there's the hourly rate mentality, which drives me up the wall. And secondly, that is that, oh, but you know, I've got to be at least the same as the competitors. Well, why? Are you the same as the competitors? Do you want to be the same as the competitors? Yeah. And we're all unique, aren't we, too? The value that Absolutely. we provide, we bring, um, you know, a lot of us who are in business have come with a lot of experience that we bring. Yeah. From- areas and then we bring that unique set of experiences and skill sets to our clients so offer it rather than being someone who's just channeled one down one particular area I mean you know you work with Fintels to do with marketing but you've got a whole raft of other experiences you bring to that conversation with clients when you're talking about marketing yeah that's right yeah yeah yeah. And so one thing that one of my coaches once asked me to do many years ago, which I now get my clients to do as well, is to actually go through and list all of the things that you've done in your life. Mm. How many hours have you spent studying? How many qualifications, not, not necessarily right, qualifications, yeah. courses and things that you've actually yeah. done? Um, listing down the, the, if you've been in corporate world and now you're working on your own, what are the things that you achieve in the corporate world? What are the successes that you've had throughout your life? And when you start writing it down, you start to realize, particularly when you get to sort of our age, there's a wealth of experience that's sitting in behind all of that and things that money can't buy. You know, time can, the time that you spend in educating yourself or in experiencing things cannot be bought. So you need to own that. So you just say, hey, look, this is why, um, you know, you, and I, I always, I look at it particularly because people do have this mentality of this per hour rate and cheaper is better. Mm. But I always say to people, well, look, you can take an absolute junior and you can pay them $25 an hour and they might take three or four hours to do something. Or you can pay somebody who's got some experience who might cost four times the amount of them, but chances are they can do it in a fifth of the amount of time, which means that it doesn't cost you anymore. It actually gets you better results more quickly and you're not wasting time having to, um, you know, work with somebody who doesn't know their stuff. I've got a really good example of that. I had a client um, who was a senior executive in a large corporate and, you know, paid an absolute fortune. And yep. you know, go back to hourly rate, you know, her hourly rate was something like, I don't know, 500 bucks an hour. It was ridiculous, you know, when you looked at the numbers. Yep. Um, she, she'd spent five hours working on this board report that she had to input and, you know, had kind of fallen, in, fallen on her to, to do a big presentation she wanted to do. Yeah contacted me she'd spent four and a half hours so you add the numbers up there took me half an hour to sort out the problem yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know you do that it makes sense to pay experts and, and, that's what, yeah, and then on the other do. side yeah <laughs> yeah and the other side of that you know we have to own our expertise we have to own what we are truly brilliant at and it's interesting because sometimes the things that we absolutely take for granted and we think are just normal and doesn't everybody do that? Yes. Often they don't. And so it's also yeah. sort of recognizing that because for a long, long time, I thought the things I did, I thought everybody knew them. How could they not? And then I realized that, no, there's a lot of stuff that actually I have, you know, over years of experience and years of education um, have learned that other people don't know. And so sharing that um, has value. Oh, completely. I agree. Um, I love the idea of listing all the successes and all the things you've actually achieved because I, I did something, um, I think I was redoing my um, LinkedIn profile a while back and I was looking at some stuff and what I was going to, I think I would look through a very old CV, you know, back in the day, I had CV, was that 15 years ago? Um, <laughs> and I looked at it and going, oh, look at this. And it was just re- reviewing it. I was thinking, wow. And you do get quite present to look at the things I've done or achieved. And it's, I think it's a great tip. I think anybody listening in, you're having a bit of a crisis of confidence, take that tip on board. 
absolutely. Yeah. And then I also think that, um, you know, we don't, we don't necessarily celebrate success quite as much as we should either. We don't actually mm. celebrate the fact that we have done things. So I work with lots of business owners, um, some of them in reasonably large businesses, and they're so busy bring the doing, um, but they forget to reward all the little successes along the way. And I mean, every little bit, every, I believe every little success should be celebrated because it builds a culture of um, high performing teams. Yeah. But we do forget because we get bogged down in that whole fighting fires, um, always chasing the really, really big goal rather than looking at what you have done every day. And that's, you know, part of that is just being grateful for what's been achieved and celebrating the, the, the successful things. Yeah, acknowledging it and being present with it what's just happened isn't it it's um it's very much the rush push 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 culture of next 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 isn't it yeah that's right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like it cool yeah, so the next collaboration I was going to talk about was about not um, putting too much activity in and not getting the leads that you actually need or the sales yeah. that you actually need for business. Probably, sorry, I have two little doggies down here just so I just start fighting. Hey, guys, we're on TV. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, yeah, I see a lot, of, a lot of business owners particularly, but also leaders in sort of large organisations doing huge amounts of activity, busy, 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 busy all the time, but they're not really getting the results that they want. And I think that's because, as you said right at the beginning, is we don't focus on accountability. We focus more on, um, you know, I don't know, what do we focus on? We focus on being busy and, and being busy and doing things rather than actually what needs to be done. And I think particularly, you know, for business owners, I see so many people who attend a million networking events who are out every single night every breakfast out there doing all this networking but they haven't really worked out from the beginning what it is they actually want from it mm -hmm. and nor are they doing the maths to make sure it's actually worthwhile so you know not i'm not knocking networking events but you have to treat it like every other activity that you do mm -hmm. and say is this actually worth my time i have spent three hours of my time that has a value of x amount what business has that brought in for me or what value has that added to my business? Is it forwarding my game? Should I be doing it? And there is a real tendency because it's fun to go to networking and it's fun to kind of catch up with people. But you have to be, you know, when you've got a lot on your plate, you have to start prioritizing and saying, right, really, what is it I'm trying to achieve and does this actually help me to achieve it? It's great. So, yeah. So when we, when we work with businesses, we often start off with the, you know, what is the big, hairy, audacious goal? What is it you're trying to achieve? In order to get that, how many clients do you actually need? And that number is really, really important. So you start off with, with the money. How much money do you want to earn? How many clients do you actually need to make that money? And then you start to do the activity based around what you need to get for those clients. Yeah. And then it can be more specific as well because often I see people go into networking events where they probably won't even pick up the right type of clients because they haven't been really clear about who is their target audience, who is the yeah. real person who will find value in what they do. And so they spend all this time talking to people who really are never going to be the right clients for them anyway. Yeah, that's a really good point. I um, I. I, did it, I kind of ditched all my networking activities at the beginning of this year to really assess yeah. what was working for me and actually yeah. found some new areas to go into, which has been really good. And, and, and I think also you can get um, sucked into, you know, just do it going to the same places and the same events and seeing the same people over and over. And while yeah. you might form great business friendships, maybe it's best to have a one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, I think that's and that was my next point was going to be right about affiliates. See, I actually find that finding affiliates that you can work with, people who you who know and trust you yeah. and who will refer people to you is, is often a much, much better way. So that's that one-on-one -on -one stuff. It's looking for who do, who do your clients actually turn to for advice? Is it their accountant? Is it um, their is it the hairdresser? I mean, I don't know, but whoever they turn to for advice. Yeah. They're the people that you actually want to spend the time getting to know. So they know you, they trust you, and they will feel happy referring clients to you. And you can do that in a formal way or you can do it in an informal way. Um, I, I personally, um, I don't attend many networking events at all now. All of my work comes through from the affiliate um, sort of relationships that I've set up. And I've got a formal one in terms of working with the Ice House, and the Ice House obviously refers clients to me. And I've got lots of informal ones with, with other accountants, with other business coaches even, with other people who work with businesses who have a different skill set to me. So this whole idea of um, co-opetition is actually kind of working together, yeah. not seeing everybody in competition, but going, okay, well, you do this. You know, you and I work together really well, Fiona. Yeah. I know that 
this really well, I do that really well, why don't we work together and refer clients you know, backwards and forwards? And again, a bit of a Kiwi mentality is trying to do everything yourself, is that, well, I can do everything, so I'll try and keep it all to myself. Yeah. I've learned myself personally over the last few years, find out what you really, really, really love, that, that you really make good money from, yeah. and stick to that, stick to your knitting. Have other trusted people around you that you can get into the other bits. Yeah. Um, because that's actually how you make a successful business. I so agree. The more that you niche, I think when I, I mean, when I first started out, I thought, you know, someone gave me an opportunity and it wasn't quite the right fit, but oh, it was a, it was a client. Oh my gosh, I had to pay the bills and you grab that. Yeah. And, oh, someone else gave you this and it was over here. Oh, okay. Um, and it yeah. was this, oh juggling and always being a little bit on edge thinking well I'm pushing them outside my comfort zone and you know while I probably got the people to help me do those projects but it was it was really high anxiety and stress because I was always outside my comfort zone so I wasn't getting in to enjoy it as much as I could you know and then now it's now fine you've got to look at the opportunity card yes exactly yeah, because you know when you start. I mean, I remember when I first started out, and we, oh, I think we're all guilty of this. I took on any client that walked in the door because I thought I've got to pay the bills. I need to have money, and so I would, I would quite literally take anybody that came in the door. And then you'd find that the people you're working with didn't share the same values as you. Um, didn't necessarily value what you had to offer. Didn't didn't work in a way that was conducive to you working together. And so as a consequence, you actually end up getting pretty miserable because you're working with people that you don't enjoy working with. Yeah. And, and also, you're so busy working with those people, you have no time to go out and find the yeah. ideal client. Yeah. So now at, at Ventel and in my Deborah Chantry coaching as well, we've got a, a list of the absolute must-haves for a client. And if a client doesn't meet that criteria and also doesn't see the value in paying us, we just don't go there anymore. And what that has done is it's freed up time to find more of the ideal clients and it also means that works is a hell of a lot more fun these days. Well, definitely. I mean, I, um, I've been doing a lot of work rebranding, getting ready to launch my new website, fiataball.co. Um, and yeah. one of the things that I've really identified was this phrase, action taker. I have yeah. to work with action takers because I can give people um, ideas and inspiration and strategies and help them figure out the how-tos. Um, well, yes, they take the action to implement it. It's yeah. no good. There's, they don't actually get any value from me at all. So, um, yeah, really having that tight, I love that, you know, having the must-have list. Anybody listening in? I think that's a key yeah. takeaway as well. <laughs> and, and it only has to be three things, you know, that don't, don't overcomplicate. We talk about business you made easy. Yeah. There, is, there was a study that was done many, many years ago um, by mm -hmm. the guys who do the um, Franklin Covey planners. So Franklin Covey basically did a study, and they looked at if you – gave people different numbers of things in terms of KPIs. If you gave them one, 100% of people would actually achieve it. If you gave them two, also 100% of people would achieve it. Once you got to three, you'd be lucky if you got two or three that were actually achieved. And then once you got over four, it started to actually decline. So wow. the more, the, the, the greater number of things you actually gave them. So four meant you got two done, five meant you got one done, six KPIs, and pretty much you didn't get any of them done particularly well. And that was because the human brain actually works in such a way that three actually is a magic number. It's something we can cope with. So I like to do everything in threes. Um, oh, my yeah, me too. I start to tune with animals. <laughs> <laughs> but threes generally. So, so three things that you know that your clients must have that you can literally, and you'll know within a, a, a few moments of meeting them whether or not they actually meet those three criteria. And yeah. even if, if they don't get one of them, that's it. They, you shouldn't even be contemplating taking it any further. That's great advice. I really like that. That makes a lot of sense because, um, you know, sometimes you've had, you know, I've met people and they're like, oh, yes, I love what you do. I've been following you and really want to work with you. And then through the course of the conversation, you get that feeling about here. For me, it's about here. And I'm like, something's off. What they're saying and then what they're telling me, there's something off in the conversation. You can kind of tell. And for me, what it's been is, Crystal clarity is they're not an action taker. They talk about what they'd like to do or aspire to do, but they're not yeah. ready actually to take the action yet. Yeah. There's <laughs> lots of talk, but they're not being their word, are they? No. <laughs> <laughs> And then that sort of brings me to the, the, the last little point that I see a lot of is the whole being overwhelmed, being stressed yeah. um, and never having enough time. 
and hey look I've got to put my hand up I've been there as well um, it's it's really easy to get into because we do we get really really busy we um, we take on a lot we, we're doing the doing stuff rather than actually thinking about what's important and this goes back to your right at the beginning the accountability thing mm. it's um, it's just about being really strict about what is important and what you want to be held accountable for mm. and making sure you make time to do the things that actually forward the game in those areas. So I don't know. Can we share a screen on here? I think we can, yes. can't we? You yes. can. Definitely. Look, I'll talk a little bit about the way that I now do things, and this has come right. from my evolved evolve leadership training, which has been phenomenal. Um, it's really around. People always say to me, "I can't believe." how much you get done. You know, you, you're always so busy, but yet you always get things done. And there is that old adage of, you know, ask a busy person to do something yeah. that will get done. <laughs> you relate to that? Hardly. <laughs> yeah. and, and the reason being is that, you know, I get quite strict about making sure that within my calendar, I do actually have time allocated for the things that are important. Mm. And so we use a thing called a time map. And I'll just see if I can, I'll make sure it's on my screen first. Yeah. Um, and I'll share the screen briefly to show you what that right. looks like. Fantastic. So a time map is just quite literally, um, this is done in a Word document, but it's about looking at your entire week and saying, hey, you know, there, there's a finite amount of time, right? We cannot create any more time. So there's no point in complaining about I don't have enough time. Time is what it is. Yeah. What you can do is you can start thinking about what's important for your making sure that you have time for it. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Is it Apollo? Two dogs. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, as you can see, this is my time map, and it's, it's the seven days of the week, and it's broken down to half-hour slots. And then what I have done is I've gone through and I've actually allocated time. And you can laugh at this because if you look at the bottom, you'll see at 9 o'clock it actually says sleep. But that's because I've recognised a long time ago that eight hours sleep for me is really important. And so if I don't actually have that time blocked out and say I will be in bed by 9 o'clock or 9.30, then it's, it's easy not to do that. Yeah. And then I have times in here for my client appointments. I've got time for my training or reading because for me, keeping you know, up to date with certain things is important. Yeah, me too. Um, obviously trying to write a book at the moment and want to get that out by the end of the year. So I've got yeah. time for, you can't write a book without having time to put some writing into it. Exactly. Um, business development, you know, looking for new clients, following up. That's always at the end of the week for me because... Um, I like I like Mondays to be very much focused on the planning and what we're about to do. Yeah. The, the Tuesday through to Thursday is around the client time, and right. then the Friday is around that book writing and um, you know looking for opportunities for clients and things. Brilliant. And um, the other thing that I, I've learned and I've learned the hard way is that every single client appointment you need to make sure that you have built in time for planning beforehand and time yes. for planning or follow up afterwards. That's because my thing. I to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I used to run from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting and sometimes I'd actually get to the end of the day and go, I actually haven't even been to the bathroom today. <laughs> um, and, and then you get, and then that brings in stress and overwhelm because suddenly it's like, oh, no, I've still got to follow up for that client. I've still got this to do. And suddenly you find yourself working until, you know, midnight or whatever it might be because you're trying to catch up. So yeah. it's just about being very disciplined, you know, with your calendar and going, right. And, now, and I can share, I'll get rid of that now, but... Um, what I can share is that with a couple of clients that I've worked with who are actually mums yeah. who you know, still have family commitments and so still have to pick up the kids and all the other bits and pieces that come to being a mum, they were really, really you know, they were really struggling with actually finding the time. So their biggest complaint all the time was, I'm, I'm too busy, I haven't got time, I can't find the time to catch up with my work. And so I actually made them sit down and block out times in the diary and say, right, even if it's just two hours, between yeah. 9.30 and 11.30 on a Tuesday, this is when I'm going to um, do my proposals or answer my emails. Yeah. And once you've written it down, you've committed to it, it's amazing how you can actually stick to it. And so because it was there, because it was in writing, because it was in their calendar, they actually made the time. And lo and behold, the proposals got done, the emails got answered. Um, and it's, it's such a simple, simple tool, but uh, it just makes life a lot easier. It's almost as if, you know, it, it feels like you're over planning, but actually it means that you get the things that are important done. I am. Um, I so agree. I mean, all of the clients I've worked with from way back, of, I call it my defa you, you, default week. So you know yeah. what your default week. I mean, life changes and things happen, oh, gosh, yeah. but you yeah. have to have you have to have a strategy and a plan. And the whole thing. Of, and I also schedule gaps. I give them mm. a, a ten or fifteen minute window 
ideally between appointments, just so I can return an urgent email or call if I need to, just to give myself that buffer. So at the end of the day, because you know, I think because I don't, you know, I designed my life because I wanted to be a parent a certain way. And that was yep. a conscious choice. So therefore that I had to be, because I had shorter, you know, shorter work hours, I had to be really, really frugal and, and plan in advance. Yep. Uh, and, you know, when my kids were, you know, when I first be, went back into my business after having my first child, I was only working um, 20 hours a week maximum. Um, so I, you know, that 20 hours, man, were they planned. <laughs> they had yep. to be absolutely <laughs> tightly planned. Yeah. yeah and I, like you said, so, like you said, it is a, it is a default week. I mean, yeah. life does happen, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with making changes when they need to, yeah. as long as it's sort of the the exception rather than the rule. Yeah. Uh, and at least you know that's what you've got planned. You make a conscious decision to go right. Okay, I'm going to give up my yoga in order to do this, but it's a conscious decision. We're yeah. not trying to squeeze yoga in when I've got some time, which of course never happens. <laughs> Completely. Yeah. I um I um funny you say that because the other week I um my husband was travelling for three weeks and I normally do uh, yoga my yoga is on a Wednesday night because <laughs> I, if I don't do yoga then I get a sore back and then I yep. get eventful when I'm not very productive working because I sit on my butt in front of a computer so I know that for me there's a whole bunch of reasons to do the yoga so I'm more productive and I can get yep. work done. So I noticed oh, the three weeks went by and I just kind of got stuck in a mentality, oh, he's away, so I can't go to yoga, rather than thinking, well, I could work during that, you know, I could work in the, um, after the kids three, I could, I, after the kids go to bed, I could do three nights where I could work an hour from nine till eight, eight till nine, and I could do yoga on a Wednesday morning and carve out, but it was because it was during the day, it was like, oh, taking yoga during the day, oh. <laughs> in a work hour but I just had Ooh, to yeah. shuffle you know to, to make it happen rather yeah. than just getting resentful and annoyed and blah 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 blah, and I can't do that and then getting sore so yeah it shift you know you really have to think about you know when life changes you know don't if you if, if going for a walk if you, you know after you drop your kids at school for those mums are listening um yeah. half an hour walk get back home get back into it I mean I noticed you know I started dropping my kids a little bit earlier so I could go for a walk from school, park the car further away, you know, just adding in a bit of exercise to make it work with the lifestyle rather than thinking I have to go back somewhere else and start again, you know, just thinking about using them the time effectively, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, one of the things that I always talk about, and it come, again, it comes from the Evolved Leadership Training, everything is about, is it forwarding your game? And in, in that example that you gave, your yoga absolutely is. So don't feel guilty about taking an hour out of your work time. If it is forwarding your game in terms of your personal and mental well-being, then it's important enough to be doing. Yeah, and I think that's a lot of the, the I think there's a, the corporate kind of shoulding that comes into a lot of us as business owners. We kind of, because the corporate, structure which is still still very much this way there's not very fle much flexibility about the hours and when you work but yeah. the awesome thing about being a business owner you choose you design it you know that's and that, you know that's that's an absolute freedom and just embrace it i think yeah, <laughs> yeah. cool <laughs> yeah so i mean those are the three kind of main areas that i've found um what do you okay. do with the, with the overall under stress thing i mean that's we, yeah. we both know that we've both had struggles with that. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think's made the biggest difference for you getting through that? Because I know there's a lot of listeners who are probably thinking, oh, I'm overwhelmed and stressed and you know, I could put my time in place. But yeah. you need to interrupt that pattern, right? Because <laughs> we get into this groove and this is how we do things. What, do you, what did yeah. you do to interrupt that pattern and make a change? Well, as you know, there's been some sort of significant changes for me personally over the last sort of 12 months in terms of some of the training that I've done. Yeah. And the training that I've done sort of uh, really opened up my eyes to the fact that I was running around. I, th I thought being busy was, was really important. I thought being busy meant that I was doing, you know, the right stuff. But what I've learned is that being busy is not that at all. And it is about that accountability. It's actually being really, really clear around what is important and what isn't and then making sure that you plan around that. And like you said, I mean, I, I work with lots and lots of business owners and they come in and because I'm a business coach, they expect me to work on a strategic plan and help them with their, their business planning and their marketing. And I 
always go back to the, hold on a second, what about you? What do you want? What's important to you? Mm. Because at the end of the day, as a business owner, you cannot separate your personal and your professional life. Um, they are completely intertwined. Yeah. And so, sure, I can help you write a great business plan and everything else, but if you haven't got the right mindset and if you're not really clear about what's important to you and what makes you happy and what, you know, what gives you joy, where's your passion, then you won't ever, well, I can't say ever, that's not true. It's <laughs> unlikely you'll run a successful business. I mean, there are some business people who have, without a doubt, run a business that they don't have a huge passion for. But in general terms, the people who end up running you know reasonably large successful businesses is because they're absolutely passionate about what they do and they stick to that yeah. and so for me what I learned through that process was that um, there were a lot of things that were going on from my past that were sort of putting like a lens over the way that I approach things and so I thought that yeah busy working ridiculous hours I thought that was being successful and what I've now learned is that that's not the way it has to be at all um, yeah yeah the corporate, and then also the looking corporate, at, you know, corporate hangover, isn't it, Deb? That's that corporate hangover is the, the badge of honour is, oh, I stayed till nine o'clock three nights yes. in a row. <laughs> the last person to leave the office, first person in the morning. <laughs> I'm the winner. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the winner. I'm yes. exhausted. I'm having a stroke or a heart attack. Whee! <laughs> and I've lost my family and I've lost my friends and I've got nothing left. But woohoo, go me. I'm an alcoholic and drug addict. Yeah. <laughs> It is that sort of, and I mean, I don't forget, I also work with, with leaders in sort of reasonably large organisations and they don't have to be that way either. I mean, that's what yeah. it's about. Life is actually far too short. And I know that we say that we overuse it, but it really, really is. And you've got to be loving what you're doing. Otherwise, you've got to ask the question, you know, what, why are you doing it? Um, I, I've had with personal experiences, you know, with friends, with family who've got very ill and, and the people are getting sort of really sick very young these days. Mm. And I think it's the way that we actually live life now. And thank God that, you know, that I, my eyes were open to that and sort of going, okay, this, is, this doesn't have to be this way. And I think sometimes it's about having, a, you know, surrounding yourself with people who can help you to understand that as well. Because when you are in a corporate environment, you will get that pressure to do more of the long hours and everything else. Whereas if you can surround yourself with people who realise there's actually a, a greater reason for being here on this earth, <laughs> then you will have that support that you need to create that life that you really, really want. Yeah. And that's when you start to really uncover your brilliance. I don't know if you've ever seen, there's a movie, um, Joseph, the Joseph Campbell, The Hero's Journey, and it's called Finding Joe. That's what it's called. Oh, yeah. And it's a wonderful kind of shortish movie. But it's yeah. all about the, the Joseph Campbell. He talks about the hero's journey and what we go through through life and, and how we end up finding our bliss. And really, really neat way of looking at, you know, we come through all these struggles. There's a reason why we go through those struggles. Then we overcome them. And once we overcome them, we return home. And, and you know, we've we found our bliss because we've actually looked for it. And a lot of people don't look for what it is that actually is that makes them happy. You know, they spend their entire time doing, be, you know, r running around, being completely busy without actually stopping and going, what, why, what is it that makes me happy? Why am I here? What do I want to achieve? What do I want to leave as my legacy? Yeah. You know, and until you can be really clear on that, it's very difficult to actually build a business that sort of meets those needs. Yeah, so as a coach, I will you know, work with a client to go, actually, let's talk about you first. What is it you really want? How do we help you to achieve a business that supports what you want out of life? And that's so important, isn't it? Because that, you know, the focus on material stuff and having stuff. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you're not, you know, you could be buried with it, but really probably not going to give you that much joy. <laughs> but it's the people that you're, um, who have in your life, um, and there's also the, you know, as good as it gets mentality as well. This is life. Yes. That's how it is that it has to be hard. Yeah. To, 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 to really put in, I think that needs to be put on the back burner, um, right. just taken out of the conversation. So I'll share with you one client that I did work with. And it was, she's a working mum and she started her business. Um, in fact, you can read about it online. Her name, baby sleep consultants. So they basically help mothers with the, who are having problems with their baby sleeping. Yeah. And when Emma came in to see me, you know, she was – completely stressed out. She wasn't enjoying her work anymore. She set up this business. It was really successful. She was in Australia, in New Zealand, had a number of people actually working for her throughout those two countries, but she really wasn't enjoying what she was doing. And so I said, well, you know, what are you doing? And it turns out that she was... She was doing a lot of the actual work herself, which she didn't enjoy doing, which was actually going out and spending nights with mothers, um, helping them to help their baby sleep. 
Well, and she didn't want to be doing that anymore. So I said to her, well, why don't you stop it? And she went, can I? I went, of course you can. Do anything you like. <laughs> so with, with my permission, as she says, she basically went away and she stopped doing all that. So we wrote a list of the things that she loved doing and things she didn't like doing. Yeah. And we decided to basically outsource the stuff she didn't like to do to other people. Great. And so uh, less than two months later, she came back into the office, a completely changed person. She was suddenly working a lot less hours. She was back to doing her fitness. She was spending time with the kids. And her business had actually tripled in terms of income. And I said, what did you do? She said, well, I stopped doing what you told me to stop doing. (laughs) Sometimes it is as simple as that, as if, you know, if you stop focusing on the things that aren't sort of really forwarding your game and start focusing on the things that are and the things that you love, because the things that you love are generally the things that, you know, that that, um, actually help the business. Yeah. It, It can have such a fundamental difference. So suddenly she had a, a job where she was free to spend time with the family. She was earning good money. She was doing what she really enjoyed and all because I told her to stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Hey, dear, but this has been great. Yeah. I'm sure there's lots of good takeaways for everybody from today's show. Um, for me, um, you know, the, um, the overwhelmed stress type thing um, in terms of, um, you know, um, really being honest with yourself that was a biggie you know but really yeah. reminding me about what it is that you um you know what it, and also and, and dovetailing with that you know the stress and the, and the overwhelm the anxiety it's probably really linked to the fact that you're doing stuff that you don't love to do yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah it's completely interwoven right um yeah. And, um, you know, planning, I, you know, I'm a, as you know, I love planning, I love organising and, and setting up templates and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and, yep. but, but, but really looking at your time and what are you doing that is actually helping you, not just as a business owner, but as a human being, like what do you need to be doing as a person? Um, and actually yep. looking at your business from the perspective of your human being with needs, what are those needs, and making sure that interwoven with what you're doing as a business owner. You know, I love that time yet um, concept. Um, I've, you know, um, Sally shared that with me, obviously. I helped set up the yeah. template, by the way. <laughs> I <was> like, Excellent. <laughs> I set the template. Yeah. <laughs> Proud mama. <laughs> um, but that, that um, you know, seeing that, um, you know, that, that for me just, you know, shows that, you know, as business owners, people listening in today, really get honest about what it is that you need to do to be the best business owner that you can be. So look at all those things that support you. You know, for me, social time is a biggie. If I'm stuck in my office and I don't get to interact with anybody, I'm working and doing and creating all these amazing, you know, documents and things, but I don't get to speak to someone, I'm like, "Mm, I'm lonely. I need that social connection. That's part of what I need. So be mindful about what you need um, as a business owner and how you want to work. Don't put yourself Mm. in a box about how you think it should be. Um, Yep. And I love the whole, you know, concept of having, you know, three key things about those ideal clients that you want to work with. I love that, you know, I'm a big advocate for the power of three because, you know, when you give someone, you know, when I give someone homework, you know, I only give them three things because I know that it's just too overwhelming to try and put things in. So, um, yeah, I love that concept of three key things actually for your client avatar, for your ideal client. I think that's yep. a great place and, you know, drilling down obviously with your team and discussing what that is. Um, I suppose that's what you've done with Bridget and in, in the other members in Ventel and stuff. And so you've all got that real clarity as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, definitely. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you t- for joining me today and sharing your little insights of wisdom. So cool to see where you've taken your business. And I'm really excited about your book. Can't wait. <laughs> First to you. grab that one when it comes out. Yep. Um, the last question I want to ask you, I ask every guest. If you could go back in time and give yourself advice when you were first starting out in business, what piece of advice would you give yourself? So it's quite interesting. Uh, It's what you started off the show with is I would actually say is that get mentors, get advisors, surround yourself with people who can actually help you. Don't do it alone. That's been the biggest learning for me is I spent many, many years doing it alone and Mm. it was tough and it wasn't enjoyable. And you surround yourself with people, whether it be a formal business mentor or business coach or a mastermind group or just um, a group of people who share the same passions as you and who are all on the same page will really help the business go forward. Yeah, me too. I yeah. took a long time to figure that one out. <laughs> <laughs> Many years of in the darkness. What am I doing? Yeah. 
crisis of confidence swinging back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. It's a fun game, isn't it? Um, yeah. Thank you for joining me on uh, the Business Made Easy show. Um, next you. show for um, the guests, uh, we'll have uh, Michelle Gugwich, who has built a successful online community. And I know a lot of us who are looking to do that, especially probably through Facebook groups, which is what Michelle's done. So she runs the Network New Zealand group. And she was able to take a group that was free and turn it into a paid online community. So I know there's a lot of us who are looking to use social media that way. So quite excited to talk to her about how she's done that and what, you know, what learning and tips she can give us around building a paid online community. So thank you so much to Jeb and thank you to Rob joining us as well. I'm sorry you're in silence in the background there, a little black dot on the screen. <laughs> I hope you got lots of information out. And um, Rob, if you're not already part of the um, Facebook community, you can jump across and join us there and get some more information. Um, to those of us who are watching the replay, um, Deb's part of the um, Business Made Easy Facebook group. So I'll post a, a little post in there about her. If you'd like to get in contact with her, she'll have a link to how you can do that. So I'm going to close off the show and um, we'll see everybody on the next show. Thank you.